NJ Spotlight presents its Roundtable series, New Jersey's High School Diploma Under Debate. This program was recorded in Trenton on Friday, October 26, 2012. This program is brought to you by the New Jersey State Chamber of Commerce Foundation. On the web at njchamber.com. The panelists in this program are Christopher Cerf, Commissioner of the New Jersey Department of Education. Casey Crable, President of Raritan Valley College. Stanley Karp, Program Director of the Education Law Center. Jamar Mills, Principal of Malcolm X Shabazz High School in Newark, New Jersey. Peter Renwick, Principal of Westfield High School in Westfield, New Jersey. And Jeffrey Scheininger, the Board Chairman of the New Jersey State Chamber of Commerce. The moderator for the program is John Mooney, Education Editor and Co-Founder of NJ Spotlight. In this program, Chapter 1, Introductions and Opening Remarks from Members of the Panel. At the lectern to introduce the program is John Mooney from NJ Spotlight. All right, let's get going. Hello, everyone, and welcome, and and thank you for coming out. Uh, I was wondering if Hurricane Sandy was even going to scare folks away from traveling three days ahead of time. So um, this is a a great honor, and I really appreciate uh, the crowd. For those who don't know me, I'm John Mooney, uh, founding editor of New Jersey Spotlight, now about two and a half years old as a public policy news site in the state. Uh, it's done pretty well, and if you, you don't know us, uh, please please come visit and visit often and tell all your friends and family and the, and the rest. This is about our uh, 15th round table that we've done on various public policy issues across the state, everything from solar uh, energy to uh, health care reform to charter schools to teacher quality. This one is a particularly uh, provocative one, a great one, obviously one that's going to affect um, you know kids and families who are you know, conceivably generations to come. Really, around the question of uh, what do we want our public high schools and our, our schools in general uh, to do in preparing our students for college and careers, as well as preparing for you know successful and fruitful lives in general. Um, we have an amazing group of panelists. Um, I'm, I'm really thrilled about that. From from those who are going to be making the decisions about this in terms of state policy, uh, to those who have to carry them out in their schools. Uh, to those who see the results of them in their workplace and in their colleges, um, really the breadth of perspectives. Uh, the backdrop, and we'll get into the details of this, but the backdrop of this is, is a plan uh, that's come out of the Christie administration, and really, to, to a degree, a lot of states, and Washington, D.C. is a player in this as well, uh, that would remake the current requirements in New Jersey, uh, ones that were articulated in a, a task force report that was released earlier this year, uh, task force that was appointed by Governor Christie, and we actually have a couple of members from the, the task force here. Um, basically, uh, in, in short, they, the, the proposals are to replace the current requirements that we have for a high school exit test, which is a one-time test given in 11th grade uh, in language arts and math, and move to end of, end of year or end of course uh, tests throughout uh, your high school career. Um, that will be deeper, the, the, the idea is that they'll be deeper and more specific and, and more rigorous in terms of the skills that, that, that students need. Uh, there's also some discussion of changing the requirements of seat time. Right now, as most of you know, you have to take four years of English, three years of math, so on and so forth. Of course, four years, I think, also of phys, uh, phys ed, and there's some talk of, of breaking that down as well and making it more about the outcomes and not necessarily just the what goes into it. Lots of decisions to be made on this. Um, this. This will not really go into effect in full until I think it's 2017, 18. It's uh, our current fifth graders. And there's lots of questions of what exactly will, will be required, whether uh, passing all the tests or not will be uh, part of the requirements. Um, and not everyone on this panel, and certainly not everyone in this room agrees that, that this is necessarily the best way to go. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a controversial topic in a lot of states and New Jersey among them, and I hope uh, we get into some of those dis disagreements and, and start talking about them. 
Now, in deference to some debates that have been out there recently that might be getting a little more attention, um, where we hear about bayonets and horses and, and things of that sort, um, I, I am, I am in, the, in cases where people talk over each other and go on too long, I, I really look at this to be, a, as, as those who have been to our sessions before, we really try to have more of a conversation than a debate about these topics. This is really meant to be a discussion where, where different ideas can come out and, and hopefully some, some agreements and even agreements to disagree. Um, and that applies for the audience too. I, I don't mind, uh, you know, some, we're certainly going to involve the audience in terms of questions, but, but it isn't really about, um, you know, applause and boos and any of those things. And, and I'm sure this, is, uh, this crowd is, is, is going to be well behaved. Now let me lay out a few logistical things. On your table, um, one is very important is um, is the biographies of, of everyone on the panel, included with their email. Uh, each of them provided an email address so that you can now contact them afterwards and follow up on things. And I think, and I hope you all do. Uh, there's also a primer on these recommendations that we're going to be talking about. It's uh, from the task force. I pretty much took them verbatim from the report. Uh, edited a little bit uh, to, to get them onto two pages, but, but it'll give you some of the specifics. And we're not going to get into all of them, but I think it's worthwhile. And then at the end of it is a link to the actual report itself, uh, which is quite long, and, and um, you can take that home with you. Uh, there's a, a self-promoting uh, membership card. Uh, NJ Spotlight is always in the marketing business, and, and uh, if you have already our members and receive our digests, you don't need that information, but then we ask you to to give it to a friend or colleague and, and spread the word about NJ Spotlight. Uh, we also have a survey that we'd ask, ask each of you to fill out um, by the end. Uh, it really means a lot to us to get a sense of what works and what doesn't and, and how we can improve. And last but not least, our index cards, which we would like to take your questions. They're index cards. We'd like to take your questions and, and involve um, your, you in the, in the discussion Basically, we have a, a bunch of us are going to be wandering around the room. We have Lee Keogh, Kevin Harold, uh, Michael Mooney, my son, is out there somewhere, uh, who, and we'll be taking, catch their eye, give them a card, and it will come uh, wind its way up to me, and I'll try to involve it in the discussion. And most certainly, I want to uh, talk about the sponsors of this event, uh, the New Jersey Chamber, um, which uh, obviously has a big stake in it and has made a, uh, this a prime campaign for the chamber. You'll see they're uh, set up in the back and please uh, stop by and, and get some information on it. They are, uh, I've known uh, Dana for a long time and, and a, a wonderful person and a wonderful advocate for these issues that go back even before you know, Chris Christie. There was a time before Chris Christie. Um, and um, and they, uh, we really appreciate their support in, in allowing us to do this. So, um, let's get going. Enough about me. I told everyone to be short and here I am talking. Um, our panelists, I'll do a quick introduction and then I'll, we're going to let them speak. Uh, probably needs no introduction on my right, uh, Chris Cerf, uh, the New, Jer New Jersey Commissioner of Education under uh, Governor Christie, uh, appointed in, in 2011 and, and uh, certainly has, has been a powerful force in education uh, policy and discussions in the state uh, ever since. Uh, Peter Renwick. Second from the right, uh, principal of Westfield High School uh, was was my own uh, children's principal at, or assistant principal at Montclair High School, and and nice to have him back in in the discussions. Jamar Mills, all the way down at the end, the principal of Malcolm X Shabazz High School, who has sat in on some panels with us before, and a, a wonderful addition. Uh, Jeffrey Scheininger, president of Flexline U.S. Brass and Copper Corporation in Linden. Uh, and the chairman of the board of the New Jersey Chamber of Commerce, also a veteran of New Jersey round uh, Spotlight Roundtables, am I right? Um, so he's a multi-talented guy. We bring him in for everything. Uh, Casey Cre um, uh, Stan Carp, I'm sorry, program director at Education Law Center, also a, a former uh, teacher in, in Patterson and, and has been a big advocate for, uh, for a lot of these issues and, and I've been working with him for a long time and, and has provided a powerful voice in these discussions. And Casey Crable, a president of Raritan Valley Community College, um, a member of the task force, and I should have said that about Peter Renwick as well. Both of them were a member of the PAT task force that uh, produced this result and know a lot about both what it takes to, uh, to uh, carry these things forward and, and the results that come out of it. So, I would like to start the discussion um, basically with a broad question before we really get into the weeds of, of what, uh, you know, what the proposals are and the, and the pros and cons of them. I want to talk about why we're here and, and what the issues are. 
um, and from different perspectives. Again, from those who are making the decisions, from those who are carrying them out in the schools, and those who are living with them in their workplace and colleges. And so I, I asked that broad question. Uh, you know, why are we here? What is the need? And I'll start with the commissioner. Commissioner, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, John, and everyone in New Jersey Spotlight, and to our host here in the Masonic Temple. I feel like I'm in a, a, a film in which we're looking for the Declaration of Independence, or if, if, anyone, if anyone happens to get the reference. But it's a great pleasure to be here. And thanks to my uh, panelists as well. We don't always agree on everything, but we always have, I think, interesting and spirited uh, debate. So I look forward, I look forward to that um, uh, as well. So l l I'm just going to start with a sort of a fundamental question, and that is why do we at the New Jersey Department of Education, or we who are in education, exist? What is, what is our purpose? What is the, uh, the objective of what in this state is a $25 billion a year um, under, under, undertaking? Uh, and there are a lot of different answers to that that one could advance, uh, facilitating the melting pot, uh, advancing democratic values, uh, and the like. Well, um, I have a very clear answer to that in my own department and in my own head, is that our measure of success is the degree to which we launch every child in this state, regardless of his or her birth circumstances, into adulthood ready to succeed in life. And what do we mean by ready to succeed in life? Well, we have settled on a tag phrase, college and career ready. And there's a little bit of content to pour into that vessel. But it means prepared intellectually and prepared in terms of character uh, to, to have a successful life in terms of economics, in terms of, of quality, quality of life. To graduate every child, regardless of birth circumstances, college and career ready. And I don't think anybody doubts, and if they do, I'd be happy to share with you the data, that graduation from high school is a key gateway towards that objective. If you look at the, you know, any, by any number of metrics, you know, the earnings potential, the mortality rate, the contact with the judicial system, children who graduate from high school have a huge leg up on those who don't. But it doesn't stop there. Children who graduate from high school and do not go on to some kind of advanced learning, whether that's a four-year liberal arts institution, technical training of some kind, training for a specific career, uh, 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 community college, um, or the like, um, also have a, a, a real disadvantage in their life uh, prospects, by, again, by almost any measure. So why are we here today, and what is the purpose of, 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 of this uh, discussion we're about to have. Here's the fundamental problem, is we um, are graduating um, children in New Jersey from high school at, at least by national standards, pretty high rates, about 83% graduation rate by the new federal, by the new federal standard. Um, all of these have passed certain requirements, the HESPA in particular that, uh, that John mentioned. The problem is that it turns out that a very material percentage of them notwithstanding having completed the requirements for graduation, are in fact not college or career um, ready. And a couple of statistics that sort of prove the point. Something like 90% of the students who go to Bergen County or Essex County community colleges need remediation. They are not ready to take college level courses. Uh, and by the way, at Rutgers, the number's lower, but it's still high. It's about, about a third. You go, well, that's all right. That's what the first and second year of college can be. Um, four, we can you know, you, you know, fill the gaps that were uh, left behind. Um, in fact, the research shows that only about a quarter of students who show up to college holding that degree, they've been at the graduation ceremony, they flip the tassel on their, on their hat, um, in fact actually end up completing that institution of higher education. In other words, it is a very, very good and I would say depressing predictor that if you don't get what you need in high school, it's very difficult to make up for that once you go on, once you go on to college. So, and, and, the, and the data points around this come from many different areas. The Chamber of Commerce uh, reports that only half of recent high school graduates could pass eighth grade mathematics aptitude tests, and that's a gate, gateway level of entry uh, for entry level jobs. Um, uh, businesses, uh, they tell me, are simply not relying on our current graduation requirements as a predictor of individuals' ability to do um, a, a job. And businesses spend a huge amount of time preparing entry-level workers for success in the workplace when they should um, uh, arrive prepared. 
So to bring this to a close, because I'm very cognizant of the, the, the John's timekeeper uh, uh, admonitions uh, on this. Uh, <laughs> um, so that's the problem we are solving for and the need that we are addressing. We convened a college and career task force uh, represented by educators, K-12 principals, teachers, union members, uh, members of the business community, Chamber of Commerce in particular, members of higher education, who also bemoan uh, the reality that so many kids come. Again, these are not kids who've dropped out. These are kids who have graduated from high school pursuant to our requirements and thought about this problem over a series of many, many months and put forward a set of recommendations, which John conveniently will give you the link to, uh, as he mentioned before. Um, and um, maybe I should just leave it at that. Yeah, that's um, good. And I, I, yeah, yeah. that gives me a, a good segue to a member of that yeah, task yeah. force, Peter Renwick. Um, talk a little bit. You're a uh, principal at Westfield High School as well as, as, as I mentioned, a, a former educator in Montclair as well. And, and talk about, from, from a principal's point of view, um, your sense of, of the need and, and why we're here to, to be discussing this. Well, I'm certainly honored, uh, John, to be here today uh, and was honored and privileged to be part of the task force. And it was uh, a fantastic experience to gain the full understanding of where we are and then to go through, as you mentioned, to go through that process to try and develop some recommendations. Um, interesting that uh, Commissioner Cerf mentioned, you know, the, the, the spirited debates that we had. There are a few of us, uh, even someone in the audience, um, couple in the audience who were on the task force and it felt like uh, a little bit of a reunion and we started those debates uh, if only the mic had been on earlier some of the things that we were talking about um, when you talk about going into the weeds there's it's a really complex topic you, you mentioned that and what I was able to come to understand through those discussions because I came from Montclair which is a well-performing school and I'm principal now of Westfield High School, which of course I'm partial, but I think it's one of the best uh, school districts and high schools in the state, to fully understand the complexity of the problem around the state. To hear you know, in much more detail the statistics that Commissioner Surf is referencing about how many students were not prepared going simply to a community college, to our state colleges where we think that when they graduate that they are prepared and what the the higher institutions have to do to assess whether or not they truly are prepared the dis, the disparity in what some schools produce um, and their ability to succeed in high school and what other schools struggle with or what the students struggle when they do go to the higher education um, the fact that they had, we talked a lot about the use of the AccuPlacer and it's uh, referenced uh, in, the, in the task force report, that this becomes the... the uh, by the, yeah, and I'm sure Casey might talk a little bit more about that, but so that became the idea of a standard of, so if a student needs remediation, we'll give this one standard. So what did that say about the value of the, the HESPA, of HESPA, and, and what did that say about uh, the value of a diploma, which I think is, you know, how we've kind of couched some of these discussions. So um, it was enlightening for me in my experience, you know, 10 years of teaching and kind of having my own experience in the classroom and, and working with standards and working with, you know, administrators on what it meant to be a good teacher, and then to become an administrator and then to become a principal to understand the complexity of what we're going to talk about today. I think what I'd like to echo is that we recognized and probably most of us in this room, that what, ha what exists now is not working the way that we want it to. And that was you know, made very clear, again, that the, the task force was made up of a few educators, then we had colleges, representative from colleges, representative from the Department of Ed, and business. And to hear their perspective of the frustration of, you know, you know every once in a while we look across the table at each other, you know, what the schools aren't doing. You know, the schools aren't doing this, and this is what we have to face. Um, and this is what we have to do to get those students ready. So we recognize, and, and the beginning of the, the report clearly identifies the problem, and, and I think it's been made clear. What I see is that there has been a real commitment by the recommendations in the Department of Ed to, to address that. And the conversation we had before this meeting, this, this uh, panel with a number of members here was how complicated that is to start to look at 
implementing those recommendations, when we talk about time frame, when we talk about having students taking more tests, and we all know that there is just a, a, a simple line of, you know, teaching to the test and the ills of, of taking more tests, but the discussions around assessment are much more complicated than that. So to really understand the issues, and now to say that there's, there's proposals on the table, we're looking to fix the problem, I think it has been very thoughtfully presented by this task force. I'm proud of those recommendations. I'm proud of the, the effort that's been made by the department to implement those. But I'm sure we'll talk more about those challenges that I see as a principal and what I, what I hear from my colleagues about you know, what some of them refer to as the perfect storm and I don't want to say Frankenstorm per se, uh, in light of what we're, you know, that some people view that as so many things that are happening right now that, that are, you know, hard to keep up with and hard to manage and hard to, to fully understand. Um, and the way that I tend to look at it is maybe things are coming into alignment and change is hard and change is needed in this situation. And so some of those things that are happening with tenure reform and evaluation and the change in assessment will kind of be difficult in the transition, but ultimately pave that road. Um, and that's an example I use too. You know, in New Jersey, we all know about traffic and roads, and we all have been on roads that are problematic, and we want them fixed. And we say this needs to be fixed, but then when, they start, when you start to fix it, and you're driving on the weekend, you say, oh, why are they fixing it now? And everybody's got a, a, you know, a story about why it should be done differently and how it should be done at a different time. The reality is it needs to be fixed. I think the task force did a great job. I think the department is implementing those things. I'm sure we'll talk more about it, especially when it comes to the challenges. But um, I was honored to be on that. I think it's a good plan, and I look forward to hearing what other members and, and uh, the, the audience has to say about the, the ideas. Thank you. So thank you. Go, go one, one further down, Jamar Mills, uh, principal of um, Shabazz High School in, in Newark. Um, this is, you know, I know you and I have spoken about this issue before. You have some, some strong feelings about it. But talk about why we're here. What, what is the problem that, that needs to be addressed? Um, I wasn't privileged to uh, be on the task force, but I did have the privilege of reading the entire document. And I will say that uh, it is a well-prepared document. Theoretically, everything within it makes perfect sense, the way they want to phase it in. Uh, the idea of actually having the test that we take within the high schools replace the AccuPlacer test, for it to be the indicator of success where a college doesn't need to test a student, that they can just enroll them into the classes that they need in order to pursue graduation and uh, pursue a career. Um, but the reason why we're here is simply because right now, as a state, uh, the students who are graduating from our high schools are going into workforces, and we're finding that businesses and employers are having a difficult time, or it's costing them more money to train these people uh, because they're not prepared or they're not at the level they expect them, expected them to be at, and or uh, they feel like the entry-level position that they came in at they'll never progress. That the knowledge that they've received from a high school and a high school diploma that they've earned, that's it. That's probably all they'll get unless we as a business train them. And I think that, that, is, that that's probably the major issue. Uh, but my concerns uh, with the issue is, though we're focusing on those that are graduating with this high school diploma and they are having uh, great difficulty in actually fulfilling the requirements of a four-year university, and or even fulfilling the job or the requirements of a, a career, the students who are actually not doing what they need to do are, is gonna be affected by the process. So potentially, I think it can get uh, worse, so to speak. It, it can definitely get worse. Uh, from my standpoint as a principal in the school that I'm a principal of, we haven't mastered what most is considering uh, low, low rigorous testing. So the HESPA test has not been mastered. We are not at 100% pass rate, whether it, it be language arts or mathematics. So again, uh, I know that we're gonna get into this later in terms of concerns, but I totally agree that something needs to be done. I also believe 
that the task force recommendations were clear and ideal for the situation. Um, end of the course test may be appropriate as opposed to a comprehensive assessment because you get to attack the problem right then and there. I finish algebra one and then I take a test where I can show if I'm capable of doing it or not. I also like the fact that they wanted to do a diagnostic, then the mid-year, and then a final assessment. So it's, it's well thought through, but the fact still remains that the content that's gonna be delivered to a student uh, will pretty much be spiraled back from an AP curriculum to a 10th grader, and they're gonna be expected to analyze that text, compare and contrast, do close reads. We're currently, we're prepping them for a test that does not require that they're doing expository writing, you know, and they're doing open-ended questions, and they're doing uh, multiple choice questions, which can potentially create a bigger gap. So the understanding why we're here is, is, is real simple, that uh, we need to uh, discuss whether where we're going is in the right direction, and if what the task force is currently uh, recommended is the appropriate recommendations. Thank you, Jamar. You, you made reference to businesses and, and some of the concerns that all of you have. Uh, I'd like to call on you, Jeffrey. Uh, speak a little bit uh, from a business perspective. You, you run a small business, about 20 employees. Is that right? Um, so you see, you see who comes out of high schools and colleges, for that matter. Talk a little bit, and also in your role as, as chairman of the, of the state chamber, your perspective on this, and, and what is the, the need out there? Thanks, John. I appreciate that. Um, these folks are all professional. I'm not. Uh, what I can do is put a personal face on our graduates. I can let you know what we face. Small company located in Linden, New Jersey. For the past 20 years, we've been ravaged by globalization. We've offshored many of our highly technical manufacturing jobs to those far off countries like Pennsylvania, <laughs> Massachusetts, and California. In order to compete with those far off global lands, we've had to add ever more technical equipment, which requires more highly educated workers. Let me tell you what I mean when I say highly educated workers. I mean high school. I mean real, live, unvarnished, fully loaded high school. I mean high school graduates that can do the kind of work we all know we were supposed to be able to do when we graduated high school. I'm talking about geometry and algebra and English and cogent uh, uh, history and some computer science. That's what I'm talking about. Let me tell you what's happened over the last several years as my initial workforce has moved into retirement. This past summer, I ran an ad in the Star Ledger on NJ.com for an entry-level manufacturing position. I, of 100 applicants who self-described as high school graduates, two were able to pass a rudimentary arithmetic test. You know, 1 8th plus 1 8th equals 2 16ths? No. For the record, 2 16ths is 1 8th. They can't read a ruler. By the way, in the ad, it said, quote, must be able to calculate fractions and read a ruler. It was stunning, and it illustrated to me why over the last seven years, my workforce has significantly changed. Slowly but surely, every single job has been filled by an employee who was educated outside of this country. Of 15 production employees, all of whom had been educated in our high schools in this state, I now have eight, five of whom were educated overseas, and one of whom dropped out of Linden High School in 19, uh, at the age of 16, and I put him through school afterwards. So we, he went through school on our resources. What's important for you to understand is small firms like mine employ most of our workforce. Government tends to pay more attention to the Verizons, the Horizons, but we're the people who put more money in the pockets of more New Jerseyans than any of those firms. And we need capable employees, and we rely on the public schools to give them to us. We don't have the resources to do it ourselves. We can't. I can give specific job skill training. 
but I rely on the public schools to provide the background, the framework upon which that can be added. So in our situation, we see that the time for these kinds of tests and increased standards is well past. We need the, this to occur and occur quickly. Organizational issues are, are important and, and successful implementation is what the pros are about. I'm about Yoda. Remember Yoda? Do or do not, there is no try. <laughs> Um, from the college perspective, Dr. Crable, also a member of the, of the task force, um, you, you see these students coming into your community college. Uh, how many, about 8,400 students? Well, we have 8,400 students at my college, and, and like the commissioner mentioned, somewhere between 70 and 90 percent of them, depending on the year, uh, need some remedial work in English and or math. What that creates is a really leaky pipeline. Uh, when you talk about growing an economy based on skilled workers, and you've got a pipeline that leaks people all the way through, it's very hard to get to uh, the vision that you have for people coming with skills that you need. And, and part of the reason that, that the pipeline leaks is that students are ill-prepared, and they don't know they're ill-prepared until they get to us. And so you spend about six months with them in remedial education trying to convince them that this really will help. Um, for many, it becomes discouraging. Um, they, they, they came to us because they wanted to study automotive tech, but they don't have the skills to read the textbook, so they have to start back here. They're not working on why they came to school in the first place, so it's discouraging. Um, the second dynamic that it sets up is it's tremendously expensive. Um, we've got about, at my institution alone, about 13% of our instructional budget, or about $2 million, tied up in um, teaching uh, remedial English or remedial math. So there's both a, a personal reason to work on this, to, to continue to build on the skills and the, and the drive and ambition of these young people, and there's also a fiscal reality that says if, we, if we're able to turn this, this uh, aircraft carrier in a different direction, slowly perhaps, but purposefully, I hope, um, that we'll be able to redirect those funds to higher technical training, um, to more career preparation and to the kinds of educational skills that will allow students to have a good, solid, middle-class future. Thank you, Dr. Crable. Stan Karp, uh, you have followed this very closely as an educator as, uh, and as well as an advocate and, and worked very closely on the secondary uh, reform proposals that, that came out of previous administrations. This is, as, as I said, this has been a long-running issue in New Jersey and elsewhere. Tell us, you know, from your perspective, uh, what, are, what are the issues that need addressing? Uh, what are the problems? You know, speak, you know, to, again, to why we're here and discussing this. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, well, I think uh, there are some points of common agreement, and then there are some points of, of concern that I don't know that we all share the same. Um, I agree, you know, it's absolutely imp important that we get more kids through the high school, that, that we keep high graduation rates, and that we prepare kids for success in life when they get out, that we do a better job of, of their preparation. Um, I think the concern is two concerns. One, that we absolutely need to do this, and the test of whether we do this well is whether the dropout rate increases dramatically. We have over 100,000 kids in the state of New Jersey between the ages of 18 and 24 who are not in school and who are not in college, and we do not need to push more kids out of school um, without diplomas. We need to make sure we find a way to do this without increasing the dropout rate. And the other question is just how much can we address this problem with uh, exit exams, with high school testing. We just had a 10-year experiment in this called No Child Left Behind. And what it pretty much did is expose the limitations of using standards and tests to drive improvements in academic outcomes, in life outcomes, in graduation rates. In many of our largest cities, this led to increases in dropout rates, and it didn't lead to the kind of increases in college access and college preparation that we want. So I think, and I agree that the task force report is a very thoughtful piece of work, and I think it provides an opportunity to learn some of the lessons about the misuse and overuse of standardized tests, which frankly, I, when I started my teaching career, the first test that was going to fix this problem was the minimum basic skills test. Then it was the high school proficiency nine. 
Then it was the high school proficiency 11. Then it was the high school proficiency assessment. Then it was the algebra one, the algebra two, and the bio test. Now it's the park test and the assessments. And I think we need to start learning the lessons of, of what's limited about trying to tie the stakes for fixing the problem to the assessments which might give us some more information about the problem. So one of the really hopeful recommendations in the task force report is at least they are first suggesting that we implement some of these assessments which are based on a curriculum that has never been implemented, uh, are tests that haven't been created, that need to be given by computer networks that schools don't have, and that are being uh, rolled out and having stakes attached to them for schools, for educators, and for kids before they even exist, I really think we need to separate the stakes for that from the process of trying to develop it and slow this train down in terms of high stakes consequences so we can see what the information says and see if we can find a way to really lead to better outcomes instead of just have harder programs instead of better ones. Let me ask, on, on still this issue of need, is this an issue in, in all schools? I mean, a lot of this, a lot of attention is, is is uh, set on, on urban high schools and the like, and I, I'm curious from the perspective of businesses and colleges as well, are you seeing this as, as, as graduates from all level of schools, from the Westfields and the, and the Montclairs as well? I mean, talk about, I mean, we're, we're, we're sort of talking about we're a broad brush uh, on, on, on an issue, and, and I'm, I'm curious if it's a, little, a bit more complicated. Than well, that. It's, it's a very indelicate question, uh, because we, and, uh, but it's one that needs to be confronted. And, and I'm very glad you asked it, because we tend to focus on you know, schools that have uh, persistent educational failure over the course and that tend to be concentrated uh, in high-needs communities, in our urban core, in some rural corners of the state, and so on. But, uh, the, but I, I'm very interested in, in uh, colleagues from down the table have to say as well, but it, I think it is also true that there are many students who are graduate from schools uh, that don't fit those criteria, that are not in fact college and career ready in, this, in the same way. Then, you know, the percentages may be different, but um, many of our schools, to put it absolutely bluntly, are not as good as they think they are when you actually get behind the data and look at what happens to children when they move, uh, when they move forward. Uh, all the strata uh, in the state. Let me ask um, Jeff right yeah. next to him. I mean, do you, is this you know true of of the Westfield? Well, I'll, I'll leave Westfield out of it for now. Yeah, poor guy. But um, I mean, you you have a, a lot of different uh, communities around you of different socioeconomic status. Is true of, of of kids from quote unquote suburban schools as well? Yes, unquestionably, it's true. It's, it's mitigated, it's not as, it, 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 but the, the, the bottom line is, as the commissioner said, there is a huge skill gap. And whether it, it, it manifests itself, which I've seen in kids coming out of um, local uh, quasi-suburban school who thought that they'd taken calculus and in fact had been in, exposed only to trig, all the way through to basic skill sets. We find that this gap exists. It's real. Um, you know, the argument that it's something that um, can be assessed by a test but can't be fixed by a test is not an argument that helps the kid. Dr. Craven? Yep. My college serves Hunterdon and Somerset County, um, and yet we have the same uh, experience in terms of students needing uh, remediation. And, I would just go back to what the commissioner said earlier, talking about um, Rutgers, our flagship university, acknowledging delivering remedial education to 33% of their freshmen. So, so I, I don't think it's a problem that's limited to small pockets of the state. Um, and I don't even think it's a problem of lack of trying. I think there's a tremendous misalignment um, between the expectations of K-12 uh, and the expectations of higher ed. I think this is a, a not only an opportunity to look at how we assess uh, how we assess student performance, but also an opportunity to look at curriculum as it moves from the primary grades through higher education and make sure that we haven't created a scenario in which the curriculum actually promotes leaks in the pipeline. Stan? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, you know, another lesson that we need to learn from No Child Left Behind. You know, we're a society that unfortunately has never sent more than a third of our kids through to a four-year college degree. So we need to make sure that college for all, as, you know, as, as worthy a goal as that is, doesn't become the new AYP. 
where it sets schools up to be judged as failures without providing the resources and strategies needed to ac accomplish the goal. Uh, you know, high school, uh, an urban public high school that has a 60% graduation rate is, is a candidate for aggressive intervention from the Department of Education as it should be. That's an alarming thing to, to happen. There is not a single subgroup of stu college students in the state of New Jersey in, a public, in public colleges and universities that has higher than a 60% graduation rate. Um, all the educational institutions that we are, that are serving kids right now these days, especially from the high needs districts, are facing tremendous challenges in the gaps between what the students need, what the issues they're bringing to, to the institution, the resources that the institution has to, to uh, meet those gaps, and the challenges and the expectations that are being placed on them. We do not need to use another system to label all these institutions as failures. We need to find out ways that they can work better across their divisions. A public high school in Patterson doesn't have the option to say 60% of the eighth graders coming in didn't pass the eighth grade New Jersey S test, so we're not going to take them, right? So we have some disconnects that I, I agree across the different parts of the system that need to be part of addressing the inequality all around us, not just the test scores coming out of senior year. Let me, Peter, I just on this point, when you were working on this report and, and writing it even, did you recognize Westfield or schools like it in, in the concerns that were raised? Well, I think, there's, I think everybody's going to be impacted because you, you lack that standard measure that, that we were looking for with the park assessments and the formative assessments that would go with a, a standard curriculum where the, the nation is trying to align, where we have Westfield with a high graduation rate, over 97% and 96% going on to higher, higher ed, and, and we hear back that they're doing extremely well. We always are looking for you know, strong data on that, but we, we hear back from those students. We also recognize that there are um, different measures of how those students succeed at the colleges that they go to, depending upon what courses they did take. And so you have one standardized high school test, but we have many different classes. And you have AP classes where we have students that are interested in the topic. And we have a couple of our wonderful students here today that I hope will have a voice in this that can talk about what they've experienced. And so there's a measure of what they do with an AP course. And there's some standard within an AP course that says, you received this grade on your AP exam, and you can now measure that against other scores, and then use data to measure that predictability of success at the next level. And so while we have a lot of that evidence at Westfield High School, it isn't the case across the state, and it was different within dis different districts and I districts and J districts and those type of things where you try and gather data. One of the things that we saw with these recommendations was the ability to, throughout the high school career, say this course was taught based upon specific criteria, standards within the common core standards that we've agreed to align our, our curriculum with, the park assessments that are working with those standards, to have formative of ass assessment throughout the process, and then a final end of course exam with the ability then to measure and say, yes, this, this standard has been met, and if there's remediation that needs to be had, then, and it's one of the challenges, there's either time at the end of the year to work on that quickly, or there's segments with a, of that course, so it's not just retaking the whole course, but now you have to pass this, this one section, you've already passed three others, let's say. So it provided a lot of information, and then when you get that passing grade, it means something. And that goes back to the point, and again, I think like we've quickly gotten into the weeds on this, is what does it mean when you don't, when you don't pass that, and how you go through remediation, and how you find the time to remediate, and how do you determine what that course prepares you for? Is it the next level, or is it at college, and you know, is it the college that then has to, say, that can say, with that requirement, with that one course, Algebra 2, you're ready for this course in college. 
do you make that a graduation requirement or do you put something on the transcript that says this is who our students are this is what they've passed this is what they haven't passed one of the things that the the recommendations and what the department has said is we need a time frame to evaluate all of that for more information on nj spotlight programs visit the website njspotlight.com we produce this program in the studios of Lubetkin Global Communications in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, on the web at lubetkin.net. For everyone at NJ Spotlight, this is Steve Lubetkin. Thank you for joining us, and take good care. NJ Spotlight, where issues matter.